Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. All right. <clears throat> so uh, my central research goal is to develop wearable devices that improve human mobility. And particularly for people with disabilities that affect the lower limbs, like amputation or stroke, or for people who have to walk long distances like soldiers. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research uh, strategy and some of our recent results and future directions. And I use three complementary approaches. First, we develop new tools to speed and systematize the design of prostheses and exoskeletons. Uh, we call these universal device emulators. Second, we leverage emulators to perform basic scientific experiments aimed at discovering and characterizing the effects of new assistance strategies. And third, we take successful approaches and try to translate them into mobile devices with a focus on highly energy efficient robotics. So let's start with emulators. And why does it make sense to develop these tools? I think a good way to explain this is by pointing out some of the problems with the traditional approach. And I'll use my, uh, my own first foray into prosthetics as an example. And I actually got started in prosthetics because of an interest in walking robots long time ago as an undergraduate student at Cornell University where I, uh, I designed and built this very energy efficient walking robot based on passive dynamics. One of the keys to the success of the device is that it uses a trailing ankle push off work strategy. So the tips and knees are unpowered. The only way that energy is injected into the system is that once per step, the trailing ankle uh, pushes off, it, it plantar flexes under torque, and that adds mechanical energy to the system. When I became a graduate student, I wanted to apply this idea in a way that was more directly beneficial to people. Looking around, we noticed that people typically use these passive elastic prostheses and have lower ankle push-off work. So we thought that this could help explain why people with amputation experience 20% to 100% increase in metabolic rate to get from one point to another. So we designed a prosthesis intended to increase ankle push-off work. Now, one way to do that would be to take a motor, stick it on the joint, and actively drive it. Uh, but we thought it would be clever instead to capture energy normally dissipated during walking and then recycle it to augment push-off. So we designed a prosthesis to do just that. <clears throat> it has a large energy storing spring. When you step on the heel, the spring compresses, capturing energy. It's then held in place with a clutch. Later, a separate latch on the toe releases. And the, uh, when the spring recoils, it is returned during this push-off phase and increases push-off work. We performed experiments on people wearing the device and found that indeed, as intended, it captured energy and returned it during push-off and that restored ankle push-off to normal levels. But everything was looking great, but we were about to be confronted with the first problem with the traditional design approach in this domain, which is that Usually, it does not work. Uh, in this case, we wanted to see a reduction in metabolic rate. Instead, we saw an increase in metabolic rate by 7%. And in my conversations with other designers of prostheses and exoskeletons, I can tell you this happens most of the time, maybe 90% of the time. Uh, <clears throat> now, if you're anything like me, you probably have some ideas about how to change our device to improve the results, right? but you're about to be confronted by the second problem with the traditional design approach, which is that uh, this tool that we developed is very bad at testing those ideas. So something I didn't tell you is that it took us five years between having the idea for the device and having something robust enough for tests on humans. And we were confronted with tight constraints on energy cost and, uh, and size and mass. And so we ended up with something that's very specialized. It does the one thing we had in mind and nothing else. So any change you want to make to this device is going to take realistically on the order of years. Compounding this problem, it turns out that little differences in device function can have a big impact on high level performance. For example, when uh, we put little pieces of little wedges of foam underneath the foot, it felt like it was a little easier to walk. And this inspired a, a side project where we just changed the rollover shape of the foot, and we found that indeed with too flat or too curved a foot, you could nearly double the energy cost of walking. 
If we go back and look at the two devices we compared in our study, you'll see that there are many such differences, right? Uh, this is a, a Seattle Lightfoot, a very commonly used prosthesis. And this is our energy recycling foot. There are differences in keel length and stiffness, damping properties, a dozen other features that could be responsible for the observed changes and high level performance. So worst of all, after our experiment, we don't even know whether energy recycling is beneficial, right? We haven't performed a controlled test of whether that functionality is beneficial to, to people. <clears throat> so these subtle little differences in device features can have a big impact on performance. A related problem is that the changes that they cause in biomechanics are also subtle. And as a fun illustration of this fact, we're gonna have some quizzes today. <clears throat> this is the first. And in each case, you're going to see a video of a person. Uh, is it possible to dim the lights a little bit? To, OK. Thanks. So you're going to see a video of a person walking with a device operating in two different, slightly different ways. And I'm going to ask you a question about what's going on. So in this case, we have a person wearing an ankle exoskeleton that is uh, uh, on one leg that's behaving slightly differently. And what I want you to do is look at the way they're walking and tell me in which case are they expending more energy? Which case are they working harder? And you can have three choices, and we're going to do a show of hands. You can say one side or the other side, or they're equal. Okay? So take a moment. Look at the person walking. Form your opinion. Do you have it? Okay. So show of hands. More energy on left side. More energy on right side. Equal. Good test takers. Oh, oh, well, usually I don't get very many people biting on that one. But <clears throat> turns out 25% higher energy cost on the left side. Right, so we had about a 50-50 split. This is typical. 25% uh, higher cost. This is a big change. That's equivalent to carrying a backpack with 25% of your body weight in it. So like a 45-pound backpack for me. You're going to notice that, right? But it's really hard to see the biomechanical changes responsible for that big change in performance. <clears throat> so looking back over this, this approach and, and some of the problems with it, I was struck by a couple of, of things. First, we need intuition. We need simple models. We need observations from biomechanics to inspire interventions. But we should not expect them to work the first time. Right? People are very complicated, and it's difficult to predict what kinds of, uh, how people respond to different interventions. And so I think what we need to do is experiments and then do lots of experiments in rapid iteration. The second thing is that the, the primary factor limiting the speed with which we can do those experiments are the experimental tools we're using. These product-like prototypes, they're cumbersome and they're the rate limiting factor. So when I became a professor, I set out to, uh, design a new way of developing these tools based on universal device emulators. The basic idea here is to take a process that usually requires years and compress it down to days. So we can do lots, test lots of ideas really quickly. And simultaneously to about allow better experimental protocols so we'll have more foundational insights into the relationship between functionality of the device and the response of the user. Uh, we have a lot of design people around here. I've been having conversations with them today. I think you could think about this as sort of a needs finding problem, but in biomechanics. You can't just ask a person what the device should do. This is our way of trying to discover that. Once we def uh, figure out what our mobile devices should do, then we can translate into a, an autonomous device. <clears throat> All right, so emulators, what am I talking about? Let me tell you about some of our systems. They typically have three main components. Powerful off-board motor and control hardware, lightweight instrumented end effectors worn on the leg, and a flexible tether connecting the two. Having this powerful off-board hardware means we're not limited by actuation and processing. So this is a two, these are a couple of two kilowatt AC servo motors, weighs 30 kilograms, but it's off your body. A lot of Over here we have a many gigahertz real-time processor, lots of I.O. You don't have to worry about that anymore. 
decoupling these things also makes the end effectors simple and lightweight. So if you're not accustomed to the design of these kinds of things, maybe this looks complicated, but it's just a few pieces of aluminum, a revolute joint, an encoder to measure joint angle, strain gauges or uh, spring deflection measurement to get the torque. And you end up with something that weighs, this is about one kilogram, a little less than one kilogram, about a third of the mass of other powered prostheses. <clears throat> and we use these devices as uh, to, to give people the physical experience of interacting with some virtual device. So they're kind of like a haptic interface, if you like. High quality torque control is therefore very important. And over the years, we've developed uh, an approach that we like. We control motor velocity as a function of three terms. First, there's a, a proportional term on the torque error, which gives us reactivity on a millisecond by millisecond basis. Then we have uh, a damping term based on the motor speed for stability. And finally, there's an iterative learning term, which provides model-free feed-forward compensation. And this is especially good in a, a complex system that's hard to model, like our emulator and the human that's attached to it, that has a cyclic behavior like walking. And it corrects the kinds of torque errors that tend to occur at the same point on every step. We performed a, a bunch of uh, tests. I won't deal, bore you with all the details uh, to, to uh, verify the, the mechatronic performance of these systems, like torque measurement error, step responses, closed-loop torque control bandwidth, disturbance rejection bandwidth, peak velocity, peak speed, and the quality of torque control under a wide variety of circumstances uh, during interactions with people. And by all of these measures, we find that our systems indeed have exceptional performance. And it's because we've tethered them to really powerful offboard hardware. Another way to see whether things are working well is to emulate a device that someone is accustomed to working with and then ask them, what does this feel like? And when we do that, our amputees tell us, oh, this feels just like a satch foot that I used to wear. Oh, this feels like my prescribed Seattle light foot or whatever. So that's another good sign that it's working. So we take all this together and we have accomplished our goal. We have really versatile tools for uh, experiments. Is that a question or just, no, okay, cool. <clears throat> how, how big is 200 meters compared to the kind of books you care about? Is that, is that? Yeah, the, the torques we care about are like 100 to 150 newton meters, so it's you know, a couple percent, right. To, to, and depending on how complex and how challenging the tracking is, maybe 5% error in the worst case. Uh, another cool thing about this is that once you've solved the offboard problem, making new end effectors becomes easier. For example, this is a device with two independently controlled toes. Uh, when you move them together, you get something like plantar flexion. And when you move them in the opposite directions, you get something like inversion eversion. So we can use this to probe balance in the frontal plane. Uh, and here's another set of end effectors that, uh, these are ankle exoskeletons we use to look at augmentation of intact people and uh, people who've had a stroke. <clears throat> Looking forward, uh, we plan to continue to develop more end effectors to increase the kinds of interventions we can explore. For example, knee exoskeletons and prostheses, uh, multi-actuated prosthetic feet, and ultra-lightweight exoskeletons for fast running, as an example. We'd like to get a complete lower limb system in the next few years. We're also looking at other modalities. For example, uh, this device uses pressurized air to shoot big steel balls into this chamber worn on the ankle so that we can, uh, into and out of the chamber on the ankle, so we can change the mass of the leg by a couple kilograms in less than a second, which is fun. Yeah. And finally, we're looking at um, in emulating aspects of the environment. Uh, this is a push spot, which can provide tugs and trips in various ways unexpectedly during walking. And we'd like to use this to develop assessments of balance. One way to see how stable a person is is to shove them harder and harder until they fall down. <laughs> and as, presuming we can get IRB approval, that will be a lot of fun. But I, I think the, the direction that I'm most excited about here is commercial translation. So a former PhD student of mine, uh, Josh Caputo, has started a company, Human Motion Technologies and has already made a couple of sales of our emulator systems to other laboratories. And I'd like to see it in hundreds of laboratories around the world, 
giving people who don't have a robotics background, maybe they're kinesiology or neuroscience or more clinical background, the ability to try out their crazy ideas for robotic prosthesis behavior or exoskeletal behavior. I think this will really accelerate progress in the field. And we also have ideas about ways that we can put these in a clinical setting and then improve the process of prescription so people get devices that they like better and also simultaneously gather a quantitative data to justify those prescriptions to insurance carriers, which has become a real problem in, uh, uh, in recent years for O&P centers. <clears throat> which brings us to our second quiz. So here we have a, an individual with unilateral transtibular amputation. He's walking with our emulator as it emulates two commercially available prosthetic feet. In this case, I'd like you to tell me which mode they prefer. Which do they like better? So you can have the same choices, one side, the other side, or equal. All right, have you formed your opinion? All right. <clears throat> We're looking for the one that they prefer. Who thinks? Show of hands. Left. Right. Equal? <laughs> Turns out they strongly prefer the device on the right. This is, uh, yeah, we, we, and, and we did better than chance there. I think there were more hands for the, for the right, but not a lot better. Uh, so this was on a scale of negative 10 to positive 10, where negative 10 is the worst prosthesis you can possibly imagine. And zero is my prescribed foot. So they really hated this condition on the left. And <clears throat> just goes to show these very subtle changes. You can kind of see that it's flexing a little bit less. And in this case, there's a little more excursion of the ankle joint. But these subtle little things have a big impact on performance. OK, so let's move on to the second part of our talk, where we'll talk about how those changes in device function relate to high-level performance. And uh, in this case, I'd like to start off coming back to push off work. But this time, we have an emulator system. So we can vary ankle push off in isolation. Everything else about the device is held constant. And we can do it over a huge range. So here we have a plot of um, push off work. We've got on the x-axis percent stride. That's normalized time. On the y-axis, we have ankle joint power. This dotted line corresponds to normal ankle function during walking at the speed. And each of these curves corresponds to a condition that we applied with the emulator. You can see we're going from half of the push off work to two and a half times the push-off work that the ankle normally performs. When we uh, tested this with people with a unilateral transtibular amputation, to our surprise, we found that as we varied push-off work over a huge range, there was essentially no change in metabolic rate. This goes against our intuition, goes against simple model predictions, even some more complex model predictions. And it, it tells us that push-off work could be a necessary component of improving energy economy with these kinds of devices, but it's not sufficient. There must be something else going on. Uh, and that tells us, that, that invites us to reconsider our understanding of why passive devices result in higher energy cost and the mechanisms by which the one commercially available robotic prosthesis does reduce energy cost. And I think it may have something to do with balance and control, which I'll come back to in a moment. <clears throat> Another fun thing about this study is it allows us to directly test some of the predictions of simple models. The mechanism by which these simple models predict that as you increase uh, uh, trailing limb push off, you should decrease energy cost is through uh, a reduction in leading limb collision. So as the leading leg hits, if the trailing limb is pushing off just before it hits, less energy dissipated. In our experiment, we varied trailing limb push off over a big range, factor of two range, but no change in leading limb collision work. <clears throat> so this, again, underlines the difficulty of predicting how people will respond to our interventions, especially with models that are a lot simpler than the human. OK, the second uh, established line of research I want to talk about uh, touches on balance. And here we have some more promising results. So in this case, our inspiration came from a model we developed, 
where we compared different ways of stabilizing the system against disturbances like random variations in floor height or side-to-side -side pushes. In particularly, uh, particular, we wanted to know, can ankle control meaningfully improve balance compared to foot placement? Because everybody knows that foot placement is essential to human balance. What we found, to our surprise, was that ankle, uh, modulating ankle push-off work on a step-by-step -step basis could actually do just as well as foot placement. And in some conditions, it did better than foot placement. So uh, inspired by this, we implemented a simplified version of our controller in our emulator. And we tried a bunch of variations quickly. And the, the control law uh, is basically this. Um, as you're transitioning to your next step, if your side-to-side -side velocity is a little bit less than normal, you push off harder. And if your side-to-side -side velocity is a little bit more than normal, you push off less. And what we found is that this reduces foot placement variability associated with active control of, of uh, foot placement for balance and metabolic rate, which we were pretty excited about. This is, um, the, you know, the differences aren't about the average behavior between conditions which were identical. Uh, so this is the first example of improving energy economy with a device that improves balance. And we've, this was, uh, this data is published. It's based on people using a, a press, uh, an amputation simulating boot. But we've, uh, since then, we've uh, completed the protocol with amputees and found actually a bigger effect, about an 11% reduction in metabolic rate when we help their balance. <clears throat> We're also looking at other ways of improving balance. One of the things that amputees complain most about in surveys is an inability to walk on uneven ground, <clears throat> uh, like out in a field, because you get these unexpected torques on your foot. And you, you can't really feel what the ground is like under your foot. And there is a lack of compliance in that direction. So uh, we've been developing a new control algorithm to try to compensate for ground irregularities. We call it ground matching control. When the heel first strikes, we first use the toes to sense the shape of the ground. We give some kind of like whiskers. And then after we know what the ground shape is, we use that information uh, in a uh, quasi-passive behavior through, for the rest of the step. And what we find, this is we just got a couple. This is hot off the presses, just a couple subjects through the protocol. But here's some data for one subject where uh, they, when we put blocks on the treadmill, they perceive that their balance is a lot worse. <clears throat> uh, but when we put blocks on the treadmill when they're using our ground matching control uh, mode, the they're the perception of the reduction in the balance is a lot smaller. So it's a, a big improvement, and we're excited about the potential here. We performed a lot of other experiments that I won't have time to go into here. Uh, in most cases, we take some feature that we think will be beneficial. We vary it over a wide range in isolation, and we measure high-level benefits in terms of energy cost, stability, and subjective outcomes. <clears throat> this is something we, we plan to continue doing with the aim of sort of mapping out this uh, space and uh, enabling the rational design of mobile devices. The next way we're leveraging these emulators is in human in the loop optimization. And uh, this is ongoing work. What do I mean by human in the loop optimization? Here we're measuring something about human performance on, on, in real time, feeding that information back to our controller changing the behavior of the device, and doing that in a systematic way to try to improve performance or change the person's coordination pattern in some desired way. And this is potentially very powerful for several reasons. Uh, first, it addresses the problem that hopefully I've established that we're not very good at discovering effective assistance strategies. So this can find them for us. The second is that there are big differences between individuals, and this can yield uh, lead to individualized control and assistance. And third, people are not static. They change, they learn about the device, they grow and adapt, and this means our devices can keep up with them. So I'm going to tell you, I have five PhD students working on different approaches to this problem in my lab right now. I'll tell you about a couple in detail. Uh, the first is, has application to prescription of devices. <clears throat> and the idea here is to use uh, 
relatively simple interface that would be applicable in a clinical setting to try to uh, discover the kind of device that a person likes best quickly. And we're using an approach of handing the patient the control. So here we have a subject walking on a treadmill. They have a joystick in one hand. They have these little sliders up here. They don't know what they mean. They tick t different sliders. They change the settings. Um, and as they do, they're navigating this parameter space. This is compressed. Each one of these runs is about two to four minutes. And what we see is uh, they choose a combination of alignment and stiffness and stiffening versus softening characteristics of the device is very consistent across conditions. So people are actually pretty good at this already, which is nice. We can leverage the human optimizer. And then we do a validation trial. We're finding that people indeed prefer the settings that they selected, even if we not just, just move one tick in any direction in the parameters, which is encouraging. So we think that a, a clinician-mediated version of this might be used in a, a, a clinic to help improve prescriptions. Uh, another strategy that we're investigating aimed at augmentation is based on a heuristic. And here what we're doing is we're <clears throat> assuming that when you have activity in your muscles, you want torque from the device for assistance. And so on each step, we measure EMG, and then we add a scaled version of it to desired torque. And this occurs over hundreds of steps. And you can see over time, the person's muscle activity is decreasing, and the torque applied by the device is slowly increasing. And note that this is not the same as just taking a snapshot of their EMG and then playing that back because it's occurring slowly over time. So the person is adapting to the device, and the device is adapting to the person at the same time. It's co-adaptation. And one of the cool things about this is that you can, uh, and you know, we're getting energy cost reductions about 10, 10, 15% with one thing on one leg, which is good. That's good compared to other results so far. And uh, the, the cool thing about this is that we're actually optimizing hundreds of parameters here. And the way we're able to navigate this space is by treating them as linearly independent optimization problems at each instant of time. Yes? So on the EMG, how many muscles are you using? We're using two muscles at the moment. So we're using soleus and TA. And we're using, we're actually, the TA is an antagonist. So we're uh, subtracting out TA from the torque. Yeah. <clears throat> torque at the ankle joint. So if you had biarticular muscles, you would probably want to do something more complicated where you have. And it's, it's always positive. In this case, it's always positive. Yes, correct. Uh, but you can imagine that the approach would apply to exoskeletons that span lots of joints and using lots of muscle activity data online. So you could potentially have somebody put on a very complicated exoskeleton and walk with it for 10 minutes and have an individualized assistance controller really quickly, which is cool. And this is a really general solution. <clears throat> We're looking at a bunch of other methods that uh, I won't go into in detail. Ordinal SVM, simplex surrogate, genetic algorithms based on fast estimated metabolic rates, system identification methods where we ID the person's response to device behavior, then use that information to decide what inputs to give with the exoskeleton to drive them to some desired state, things like that. And I'm, I'm, I think that over the next few years, we're really going to do some foundational work in what, what I think will become a, an important subfield in wearable robotics. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is an area of future work, and it relates to uh, predictive musculoskeletal models. So the, one of the dreams in musculoskeletal modeling for a long time has been, uh, can we predict how people will respond to some new mechanical interaction, some new device? And this would be a boon to designers because we could compress the time down from days, now down to seconds, to get an evaluation of the effectiveness of some, some dreamed up uh, device. But I probably have managed to convince you this is very hard very challenging problem. And I think that what we need, uh, something that would help us make progress here is 
more training data. And these emulator systems are great for generating that training data. So the, the sort of cycle I would imagine is musculoskeletal simulations generate good experiments to perform. Experimental data is fed back into the simulation. And then we uh, both improve the predictive validity of the simulation while simultaneously discovering new assistance strategies. And I've done a little bit of work in this direction with um, Manoj Srinivasan at Ohio State University, and this is something I'd like to do more of in the future. <clears throat> Which brings us to our third and final quiz. Last chance to get it right. Now in this case, you can probably tell the difference between the two videos. You see, you see it, right? You, so uh, the question now is not which is different, but rather it's a quantitative question. How much harder is it to walk with your arms swinging in the opposite direction as normal? <laughs> How much harder? <clears throat> and we need a number here. I'm looking for a percentage increase in energy cost. Do we have any brave guessers? Any volunteers? Yes, sir. 38% higher. I'd say 12%. 12% higher. 100%. 200%. OK, well, it turns out it's a 25% increase in energy costs. So splitting the difference, you guys are pretty close. Yeah. Uh, again, a huge increase. When I saw this result, my, just, my head exploded. I mean. Your arms do not bear any load during walking. Your hands do not touch the ground usually, right? Uh, <coughs> hopefully. Uh, people have argued that arm swinging is vestigial, that it's just a, a, a neural relic from when we were quadrupeds, right? But it turns out actually normal arm swinging is an essential part of economic gait. And so hopefully I've managed with these illustrations to convince you just how hard it is to predict how people will respond. All right, in the last part of my talk, I'd, I'd like to discuss translation to mobile devices. And here, um, the, the successful strategies we've discovered so far are just reaching the point where we're ready to, to translate them. So I don't have very interesting results to talk about. Instead, I'd like to talk about some translation that's based on earlier basic scientific research, particularly work in the mid-aughts by a group um, uh, and reported in a paper, Ishikawa et al., in 2005. And uh, so this is, this is what inspired the study I'm going to describe. Um, this group showed, they used ultrasonography of the calf muscles to show <clears throat> that while the ankle joint produces more positive work during walking than any other joint, most of that work is done by elastic recoil of tendons. And this is a, you can see this is the power, and this is the contribution of the tendon, according to their study. And that the, the muscles themselves, the muscle fascicles, remain largely isometric, especially in early and mid stance. So they're holding one end of the spring as it stretches and recoils. But we know that muscles consume energy whenever they're active, even if they're not doing positive mechanical work. So my, uh, my colleague and friend, Greg Sawicki, who's now at North Carolina State University, and I, we saw this as grad students and thought, what if we put a clutch in parallel with the calf muscles and a spring in parallel with the Achilles tendon? Maybe we can offload the calf muscles and reduce the energy they consume a little bit. <clears throat> now, we wouldn't want to compliant a spring. Otherwise, it would do nothing. If we make the spring too stiff, it will probably interfere with normal ankle motions. But maybe there's a sweet spot where it makes walking easier. So we uh, built a device that does that. And here I'm going to walk you through how it works. We're going to look at this leg in the foreground. And <clears throat> uh, during swing, the ankle can move freely. At the end, just before the heel strikes, this clutch engages. And then there's a tensioning spring that takes up slack. It's holding the other end of the string while the spring stretches and generates a plantar flexion torque. Then at the end of the step, it recoils. And the clutch disengages. And you can move the ankle freely during swing. Or to put that more simply, when your foot is on the ground, the spring is engaged. When your foot is in the air, the spring is disengaged, so you can move your foot free. When we 
uh, tested this on people, we found that muscle activity in the soleus decreased, particularly during early and mid stance, as we had wanted. And we found that energy cost also was decreased for a moderate stiffness spring. With uh, just at the sweet spot, we got an energy cost reduction of about 7%. We were very excited about this result because people have been trying to reduce the energy cost of walking for more than 100 years. And it's only been in the last couple years that any devices have reduced energy cost. Uh, and there's a handful of devices that, uh, to, to date. Uh, and in those cases, it was always with very high power devices where the energy input from the device greatly outstripped the savings for the person. So it made the uh, gait less efficient, actually. Because this is an unpowered device, it actually makes the human plus exoskeleton system more efficient. Or to be more provocative about it, people have been evolving to be efficient walkers for 7 million years, and we just beat out evolution a little bit. <clears throat> All right. So the last part of the talk, I, I'd like to talk about a technology that we could use to make these unpowered exoskeletons into a product and also has application to a wide variety of wearable devices. One of the problems with our unpowered clutch is that it engages and disengages based on joint angle and, and some history. So you have to hand tune it and it may work well at one speed but not another and the spring stiffness might be right for walking but not running. So we'd like to be able to control these things better. <clears throat> Over the last couple of years, we have been investigating a new type of clutch that's electrically controllable but still lightweight and low power. It is composed of these flexible electrodes. This is aluminum sputtered mylar with a dielectric coating. And we uh, place the two electrodes on top of each other like this and hold them in place with tensioning springs. When no voltage is applied, they slide freely past each other. When we apply a voltage, they withstand large shear forces. If we put a, there you can go with some large shear forces. You put a, a, a spring in series, and now we have a system very similar to the one from the other device. If we put several clutched springs in parallel, now we can select the overall stiffness of the device. <clears throat> So we put this on an exoskeleton as a demonstration during a dynamic task like walking. You can see the spring stretching there when it's engaged and the joint sliding freely when it's disengaged. <clears throat> and had people had uh, one subject walk on the treadmill for a few hundred steps. We used a very similar control pattern as with the unpowered exoskeleton. Just when the heel strikes, we start waiting for maximum plantar flexion, then engage the clutch. A large torque is developed over the course of stance, and then we disengage the clutch and get no torque during swing. Uh, the, the performance characteristics of this clutch are, are pretty strong. Uh, it can withstand about 100 newtons. The mass of the electrodes is a little less than two grams. The power consumed is less than one milliwatt to cycle it at one hertz. So these are order of magnitude improvements over conventional electromagnetic and magnetorheological clutches. Uh, the applied voltage is 240 volts, which might sound like a lot, uh, but it's actually rather low. Um, it's two to four times lower than a lot of the electrostatic systems used for, say, wall climbing robots. And that has a couple of advantages. One is you can use conventional electronics. So you could put this in a compact mobile device. And another is that you avoid problems with space charge, which can prevent things from automatically releasing when the voltage is removed. And that's perhaps part of the reason we get pretty good adhere and release times, about 30 milliseconds each. Everything you see over here is about 26 grams, and the whole thing has a resiliency of about 95%. <clears throat> so we're really excited about this technology, and it opens up uh, a cool new space of designs where you can have lots of independently controlled clutches in one system. And you could use that not only for this selectable stiffness device I described earlier, but other kind of crazy things that we've had rattling around in the back of our minds for a little while. 
Something I'm particularly excited about is a new type of energy recycling actuator. So the, the functionality that I want and have wanted for a long time is this. Big energy storing spring, CBT in series with your output. You can imagine if the spring is stretched a little bit, then you can get any force you want by changing the ratio of the CBT. And then you can port energy into and out of the spring with force control. <clears throat> and this is especially beneficial in tasks like walking, where if you're going at steady speed on a level surface, there's no uh, energy input is required. It's the energy, the mechanical energy system isn't changing over time, right? So the ability to capture energy in a controlled way and then return it in a controlled way could be really helpful. The problem is that CBTs for robotics are terrible, right? They're heavy, they're big, they're bulky, they're uh, lossy, they don't like to shift at zero speed. What if instead we use clutches? So here we have just two clutches uh, where we can have two forces on our output. One would be if we clutch the spring to the output, we get some force. In the other case, we clutch the spring to the ground, and then we get no force on the output. But we don't lose any of the energy stored in the spring. OK, well, that's two force settings. That's not enough. What if we put a bunch of clutches together or a whole lot of clutches together? Now we have a, 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 a discreetly variable transmission between an output and a set of energy storing springs. So we could get the benefits of energy storage and return with the controllability of a conventional electric motor kind of system. So I'm very excited about this kind of stuff. Um, I think some combination of our electrostatic clutch, the basic characterization experiments that we're now performing, and applications to multi-clutch systems like this will probably be the subject of our next big publication. OK, so uh, before I stop, let me just thank the students who did most of the work. Uh, Josh Caputo, who built our first emulators and now is president of Human Motion Technologies. Uh, stu just just going to single out a few people whose work were, uh, was most represented in this talk. Uh, Stuart Diller, who's led our electroadhesive clutch work. Rachel Jackson, who's led our uh, work with powered exoskeletons. Myung Hee Kim, who's led our balance augmentation work. Robbie Quesada, who conducted the study on amputees, uh, where we varied uh, push-off work. Kirby Witte, who's led the design of our exoskeleton systems. And JJ Chang, who's led our control hardware design. I'd also like to thank my sponsors, especially uh, NSF. And thank you for your attention. Yes, sir. So I was interested in the human in the loop optimization. Mm. I didn't quite catch, because it's a, it's a real problem, because everybody's different, and you want the system to optimize for the individual. And everybody who's building robot robotic systems knows they work well in some and not others. But I didn't understand this. What's the optimized field? Right, so in this case, yes, so uh, I call this a heuristic-based method, because um, in order to get this benefit that we can set a large number of parameters quickly, uh, we have to give something up. And in this case, uh, we, we can't measure the metabolic rate attributed to each instant, right? It's very slow. So uh, we're using we're, uh, the heuristic that if, met if uh, muscle activity decreases, effort will also decrease. So it's, but, but it's, it's separated by one. And it's possible that the, the um, Achilles heel, if you will, of this approach is that if our heuristic is wrong, then we won't get a high level benefit. So there are pluses and minuses of each kind of approach we're looking at. You try to optimize on the MG and then you do an experiment to do metabolics and then that. Yes, in, in this protocol, uh, the video you're seeing right here, we simultaneously measured metabolic rate and metabolic rate was decreased by 12% for this picture. Yes, sir. <coughs> That's a good question. Uh, so so we, we haven't tried rolling it, the, and it's, it's tricky. Uh, so this is a, it's an interesting idea that 
we've been thinking about. So one of the weird things about this is that um, in order to get adhesion, these two electrodes really need to conform to each other. And they, they actually need to displace. So if we roll it, that corresponds to a change in diameter. And it's going to need some sliding somewhere. So there's, there's an extra degree of freedom. And that may slow things down or cause interference. We're not sure. Does that, that make sense? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so this, is, this works on capacitance. So there is an electrode. This invisible thing over here is an electrode that's covered with a white dielectric material. The dielectric is a, a uh, barium titanate nanoparticle fluoropolymer composite. How's that for a mouthful? And, but it has very high dielectric strength. Actually, this outperforms our expectation based on the barium titanate properties so there's something else going on there that we haven't figured out yet that could be interesting. It's by like an order of magnitude. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also. curious on the electric clutch. What is the failure mode? If you apply too much force to it, is it successful or disastrous? It, uh, it slips off. So if you apply too much, it's disastrous. Okay. To answer your question <laughs> directly, it's disastrous. Uh, so failure modes, uh, we don't really understand the mechanisms of failure yet, whether it's, say, like a crack propagation or if it's just bulk sliding, we're, we're looking into that. But, uh, but yeah, it'll slip past quickly. Another failure mode is it can short. So you can get a little spark through the dielectric, and then the capacitor discharges, and then it slips. Now, one cool thing about this is that when it discharges, it actually ablates all of the aluminum. And then it works again afterwards. It's sort of a self-cauterizing property, which is kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, please. That is a really good question. So my uh, Josh uh, thinks that he can get a price point down to about twenty-five thousand dollars. So the which yeah for, for a clinic it's that's that's their what they he, we've been talking a lot with uh, different clinics in the Pittsburgh area area and with insurance companies and just lots of people in in the domain to try to understand you know what's the reimbursement uh, reimbursement model which is probably like it's a service and what, what kind of, uh, if, a, if a company was going to buy one of these, what's their price point? And uh, so it, I think it is viable, yeah. So the, the, the real hurdles are first to show that it, there is a benefit to the patient, that they get a better prescription. Second, that uh, for the value to the, to the uh, clinic is that the data collected from it will help them to justify a prescription, which is, as I alluded to, we've, to with, um, the Affordable Care Act and some investigations into fraud and abuse in, in clinics, the standard of evidence before allowing a prescription of even a relatively moderately functioning device, like a $1,000 flex foot, that burden of proof is increasing. So this could help um, to justify uh, these purchases in the cases where they really benefit a patient. Another question about benefits. Yeah, 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 please, yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, I, I'm very interested in uh, humanoids still, um, per perhaps a little farther off on my horizon of uh, research and to add into my research portfolio. Uh, and, and when we come to humanoids, I think we have the benefit that our models of how they work are pretty good, actually. Like, you know, our, our models of rigid body dynamics and how motors work and sensors work, they're pretty good. So we can do a reasonable job simulating the system. Now, there's 
robustness problems and so on. But so as long as we use some robust control algorithms, um, it's so it's a slightly different problem set of problems than with the human, where basically the nervous system is impenetrable at the moment. We we really have a hard time understanding what it's going to do. Um, but on the, on the mobile robot side, what I'm excited about is trying to build a machine to take on the W prize. And this is, yes, this is a, a little known cash prize challenge in walking robots to complete a pretty challenging course with a very aggressive target on efficiency of the system. So it's like walking on cinder blocks and up and down stairs with half of the energy cost of what it would take a human to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but this thing right here, this, this is the key, I think, to uh, enabling a robot to do something like that with such low energy costs. And of course, you have all kinds of uh, control problems and, and so on. And I'd probably want to team up with somebody in mobile robotics to handle the vision side and all that. Soha. Absolutely. So, so clearly, the, the functionality of a, a mobile device will always be a lot lower than our emulator system. Uh, but what we want to do is give people the tools to predict how the human user will react to what your device does. So you can uh, make a, a good decision about trade-offs as you're faced with those constraints on power availability and so forth. And what I found is that in the robotics community, people are very creative and clever with coming up with mechanisms and new actuation schemes to accomplish some target, right? So if we can tell them what the target is, I think people will come up with cool ways of designing the autonomous device. It's a problem that lots of people are interested in. Uh, I have faith. Even if it's just, even if the answer is, oh, okay, well, you need, a, you need more energy density in your battery. Well, then at least we know what the target is, right? Yeah? I was going to ask, are you able to pair the dynamic weight uh, input with the emulator so you have some kind of trade-off on like, oh, yeah, we could give you more torque in this case with a heavier motor. You could dynamically like on the fly just torque with that. Exactly. That's, that's exactly the plan. Um, so w one of the intriguing hypotheses that we've been batting around recently is that in order for ankle push-off work to be beneficial, maybe you need a really heavy foot. Like usually having a heavy foot is very bad. Um, for every uh, kilogram or for every 1% of body weight you add to the ankle, your energy cost of walking goes up by 8% or something like that. So usually adding, you know, if you have a three kilogram prosthesis, that would usually be bad. But with an amputee, actually, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot less mass in a typical prosthetic device. And so maybe you need that mass to, in, you know, for the, exactly, to, to put the uh, energy into kinetic energy of the leg. And maybe that's part of the way it's beneficial. So that's something that we're planning on looking into. Kind of a, a wacky hypothesis, but. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. 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 Thanks.